Hello, and welcome to Breast Cancer Conversations, a podcast brought to you by survivingbreastcancer.org. I am Laura Carfang, breast cancer survivor and founder of survivingbreastcancer.org, a nonprofit organization providing community, education, and resources to empower those diagnosed with breast cancer and their caregivers from day one and beyond. Hello, hello, my friends. You asked for it and we got it for you. I am so pleased to be speaking with Dr. Sharon Bober from Dana Farber Hospital. She is the founder and the director of Dana Farber's sexual health program. She's a senior psychologist and assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Bober and I met at the NCBC conference in Las Vegas. That is the National Consortium of Breast Centers. I was able to attend one of her lectures and learned so much, and not just learning about sexual health, but learning about how this was actually my story. Everything that she was saying scientifically was everything that I was experiencing. So needless to say, what happens in Vegas doesn't always stay in Vegas. I sought out Dr. Bober and invited her to be a guest on our podcast. In the context of my um, sort of overall intake, right, and, and people sometimes say, well, why? Why did you ask about sexual health? And that I'm not totally sure about, but I just know that it's just, it just struck me that that was just something that was part of whole person experience, right? And when I would ask about all kinds of function, at some point I would ask about sexual function and everybody would look at me and say, well, interestingly, you're the first person who's ever asked me and it's horrible. Welcome to the conversation. I'm a clinical psychologist, and I am uh, the founder and director of our sexual health program, Um, and I've worked in uh, the survivorship center, and I've worked in the context of the uh, cancer genetics group um, for many years, and those are really the two things that I do at Dana-Farber. When did you start the sexual health program at Dana-Farber? So it's an interesting question. Somebody asked me that recently because I, you know, when we started, it wasn't like a program, right? It was like, I basically had this idea and I talked to a few people and people basically said like, what are you talking about? You're crazy. Um, And I said, well, I, you know, it's funny. I, I've been working. I mean, I, initially, let me just say when I came to Dana-Farber um, soon after I, I finished my training and I had my first position, um, all the way across the street at the Beth Israel, um, I had been working with, um, essentially was asked to come to Dana-Farber because there were people um, putting some attention to women, young women who had been treated for Hodgkin's disease with radiation, chest radiation at an early age, and were getting breast cancer at an early age. Um, Secondary, this was a late effect from having chest radiation for Hodgkin's when they were, for example, teenagers or in their early 20s. And um, it was in that context when I came to to Dana-Farber, I was essentially working primarily with adult survivors of pediatric cancer. So these were lots of young people, 20s, 30s, 40s, and older, who had been treated as children or young adults. Um, And in the context of my... um, sort of overall intake, right? And and people sometimes say, well, why? Why did you ask about sexual health? And that I'm not totally sure about, but I just know that it's just, it just struck me that that was just something that was part of whole person experience, right? And when I would ask about all kinds of function, at some point I would ask about sexual function and everybody would look at me and say, well, interestingly, you're the first person who's ever asked me and it's horrible. And this happened over and over and over. And I was like, well, what the heck's going on here? And um, at first I was like, well, maybe this is like a New England problem. I'm not from New England. So I was like, <laughs> we just don't talk about sex in New England. Maybe that's just something we do in other parts of the country. Sure. Um, I've since learned that we don't talk about this in a regular way anywhere. Um, but it was really out of that experience, out of my clinical experience that I said, wait a minute, just what's, you know, so I started to do training, right? And I mean, just to be clear, as a health, as a clinical health psychologist, we don't get training in, in, you know, sexual health in any real way. Um, Oncologists certainly don't get any of that. And so, you know, I, I sort of, before I could even start, I had to figure out what I didn't know, right. I had to go back and get some training and do some supervision and courses and reading. Um, And then I basically went to some of the folks at Dana-Farber who I really trusted and respected. And I said, we have to do something about this. Is there some way we could start some kind of a program, a place in a regular way where people can get some help and consultation. And 
so, you know, that was done very much uh, as a pilot, right? And I want to give a shout out to, you know, Lisa Diller at Dana-Farber and you know, some of the people who are really pioneers of cancer survivorship, because at the time, like there was nothing like this being done. There was one program in the country, which was at Sloan, uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York, which at that time had a program for women specifically in the GYN cancer group. Um, and I went down there and spent time with Dr. Jean Carter and said, what are you doing and how do you do that? And, you know, very much specific to, um, GYN cancer. And, um, and then we sort of started slowly, right? And at first I thought, nobody's going to come, nobody's going to ask. And um, so that was probably about 15 years ago. Um, what I would say is that over the course of really the past really 10 to 12 years now, we've had a very, um, we have a very robust program, you know, so it was really a bit of a startup in those first couple of years. And I was going around and meeting with people and saying, Hey, you need to ask about this. And this is, there's a place for people to go. And, you know, and and everybody was like, yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, now, um, you know, it's, it's exciting, but it's also challenging on the other side because we have a many month waiting list and it's hard to get the, yeah, it's hard to even provide services because there's really a big demand. Um, But that's really where we started, you know, and, and I think, the the fact is figuring out how to get um, sexual health as part of just health, right? As right. just part of regular care, as having that be on the on the docket, on the record for things that we just ask about and talk about openly. Not more important, not less important, but just part of all of the things that we ask about. Um, that's really been the mission, you know, uh, in terms of my work at Dana Farber. That's just incredible work. We hear a lot that you know, depending on the age in which you are diagnosed with cancer, people who are premenopausal have very different needs than those who are postmenopausal. And that can range from not just sexual health, but also, you know, mental maturity, different experiences that they're having in life and different needs. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Uh, so, Right. So when you think about it, even to your point, you know, postmenopausal, I mean, it's not just about menopause, right? Most people at that point have already had full sexual relationships, have already experimented and started, you know, exploring what sexuality looks like, you know, depending on, on the age and stage where people are, you know, often people are single, often people haven't even had a chance to develop, you know, relationships yet. And so that's complicated, right? When you're starting out and feeling um, behind your peers, right. Or out of step, if you, if you haven't had a chance to do some of the kind of exploring or, or dating or just, you know, self-exploration that other people have had, Um, certainly um, around uh, treatment for menopause and specifically any treatment that brings a young woman into menopause, right? It's a game changer. Um, And we know that it is not um, just, it is not like just hormones, right? I mean, our, we are fueled by estrogen in so many ways. And when we um, turn off ovarian function, when we suppress ovarian function, when we take medications that specifically take estrogen out of our bodies, um, we know that it is very effective in terms of reducing risk of cancer recurrence, but it's a high price that we pay um, in terms of the side effects. Um, and, and, and those side effects are are pervasive, right? They really are, you know, women can have an experience around, we talk about, you know, chemo brain and feeling like, you know, changes in sleep and changes in cognition. Um, Certainly those are being studied. We know from the kind of sexual health point of view, from the, um, the, the the sort of menopause framework, um, there are many changes. So there are what we call the uh, the obvious vasomotor symptoms. People talk about hot flashes and night flashes and, and how that can mess you up around sleep and fatigue because you're having hot flashes and night flashes, you're not sleeping well. And we, you know, all of those issues. Um, but what we don't talk about as regularly are what we call the genitourinary symptoms of menopause. So it's not just about vaginal dryness, but it's really about um, the, the integrity of the genital tissue, right? It's also about the pelvic floor. It's about the fact that our urinary system has millions of estrogen receptors. So when we take estrogen out of the picture, um, there are real changes um, to the body that we need to be proactive about. Um, women don't get a lot of information about vaginal health. Women, you know, we as much as we hear about sex or see sex scenes on TV, 
it's not anything about real bodies in real life, right? So if if there are changes, right? If if all of a sudden we go through treatments and and we have now dryness or discomfort with or without sexual activity, you know, I mean, sometimes it's not about being sexually active. It's about pain with a GYN exam or discomfort when you're riding a bike or exercising because that genital tissue is dry and doesn't have the moisture that it used to have. It affects quality of life, right? It's like, it affects your whole life. Um, So, you know, that's just one very specific physical aspect, right, of an experience, but that's very impactful, right, when you think about that. And that's what I love about your work too, is that, you know, it's not just the physical aspect. It's not just the vaginal dryness or the discomfort during sex or anything like that, but also treating the whole person and the quality of life, right? You are touching upon the relationships and the exploration there too. So Absolutely. As I always explain to people, sort of when people hear me talk, I, I know it's probably sound like a little bit of a broken record, but I always sort of start in the first um, kind of place by saying that I really understand sexuality and sexual health to be at the intersection, right, of physical and emotional and relationship and actual cultural kind of factors, right? All of those domains um, are in play when we think about what sex is, what sexuality is, what sexual identity is, all of that stuff is sort of at the middle of all of those places. And the fact is cancer treatment can really disrupt or derail things in all of those domains, right? It is not, it is rarely only physical. It is rarely only in someone's head. Um, It is rarely the case that when a couple is having trouble, it's out of the blue, right? There's usually something that's going on, some context that we have to consider or some history. Um, And I think it's important when we think about um, whatever people are struggling with to really be able to help people identify kind of where things are disrupted, right? So that it's not being reductionistic, right, to say, they like, oh, for that. I mean, sometimes it's nice to say, oh, is there a pill for that? Uh, but often when it comes to sexuality and sexual health and sexual identity, it's a little more complicated, right? It really is about weaving a kind of a complicated tapestry together and then being able to figure out what we need to do when things have to be tweaked or changed um, to adjust or cope with something different. Yeah. So really the whole picture and kind of this multi, like multi-dimensional approach to sexual health. I I think that's, to be honest, I I think that's the way to go. You know, I think that when we, I mean, it is certainly true that sometimes there's something very specific that can get addressed and that takes care of everything. And that's great. And obviously less is more. And if you can just do something simple and change everything, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Um, But sometimes it's not that simple, right? And I think that Mm -hmm. um, it's just important for us to be able to help people kind of take a kind of a whole person perspective. So there people have a kind of a a sense of what to do or a roadmap for where to go. And so what type of support services or recommendations or tools do you build into something like this sexual health support that you're providing patients? We start by having a multidisciplinary clinic, right? So we have a a, a context where um, people can certainly meet with a psychologist, right? In this case, a psychologist who has specific training in sexual health and cancer. Um, But there's also a gynecologist available for people to see. We also work very closely with some of the most excellent pelvic floor physical therapists in the universe, right? We're very lucky to have some of those folks in Boston um, because often, again, you know, when, again, there is disruption or um, changes in, in, uh, genital tissue and in, uh, estrogen levels, often there is pelvic floor dysfunction that pretty quickly gets engaged, right? Mm -hmm. If, if somebody's having any kind of sexual activity, that's painful, those pelvic floor muscles can self guard and people start to clench up and tense up. And there's a lot of tension that it's held in the pelvic floor. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, often very quickly, there's a kind of a, a physical function piece at the muscular level that we have to address. So like we, for example, work very closely with the PTs, right? Sure. And and the PTs will say to me, okay, I've now worked out um, how to help somebody regain some elasticity to that tissue and to, to relax those pelvic floor muscles. But now I'm sending them back to you because um, they have no idea how to talk to their partner about what to do next, right. right? So it's one thing to do the physical piece, but now how do we start to help somebody reconnect with their partner? Because they need to figure out the communication piece. So, you know, just in terms of the kind of program we have, um, I think by virtue of the kinds of different providers, right? We also pull in endocrinology when we need to. We work with reproductive endocrinology we have uh, 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 
uh, urogynecologists at the Brigham that we also connect with as needed. So it's just important to be able to sort of have the different aspects of care available. Um, and then I, I would say in terms of the kind of work that I do when I meet with folks is really, again, to be able to do a very thorough uh, assessment and consultation to sort of figure out not just um, when the problem started or what they're concerned about, but to get a sense of how things were before. You know, sometimes people had certain challenges before breast cancer, Absolutely. right? And if, if those weren't addressed on the front end early, you know, they may be more challenging now, but there may be things we need to deal with that were, you know, before cancer treatment. Um, and then we sort of really come up with a, a kind of a game plan um, for what the steps would be for kind of what we think of as rehabilitation or for recovery. You know, I had, um, chemotherapy first before my surgery. So on in some regard, you know, I had about six months to like really research the surgery options and really get comfortable of sitting with my diagnosis as I was losing my hair and going through all of the, the chemotherapy. And, you know, we all relate and understand when you're going through those consultations with your oncologist, it's a whirlwind of new vocabulary. And I remember him telling me, it was a male oncologist that I had who's phenomenal, telling me that, you know, I'm going to go into menopause and, you know, you're not going to have your period anymore. And here are some of the, you know, you might have weight gain. We encourage you to walk. You know, it's very like you're being inundated with so much information. It's a lot of information. And I yeah. remember going home like, I don't know what menopause is. Like, right. I I, I mean, I can Google it and I know it's something my mother goes through, but it's not right. something that I understand what it is, nor did I have that like mother daughter talk of like, you're going to have right. this, you know, right. five to 10 year period of going into menopause, right? Versus the I mean, so that's a, such a great example, right? That we don't even talk about menopause, forget <laughs> breast cancer, right? Like in general, like who talks about menopause in any real way? You know, there's lots of hushed conversations that yeah. women have with other women in menopause, as you said, in their fifties or sixties, mm -hmm. but it's like, we don't really even talk about about that. So it's interesting, like when someone says, oh, you'll be in menopause. I can't tell you how many times women say to me what you just said, which is that I actually don't know what the heck that means, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and what we also know is that menopause in a natural kind of way, right? As opposed to a treatment induced kind of way is a, is a very different animal. You know, when your body mm -hmm. has many years to adjust slowly in the years that we talk about perimenopause, you know, the kind of treatment induced menopause is what I refer to as the driving into a tree menopause, right? It's, it's a very, very sudden, it's abrupt, you know, hormone levels change dramatically, right? Mm -hmm. And that is for many women, a much deeper, steeper dive, right? Um, into um, much more severe symptoms. And so I think that, you know, it's, it is the case that often people don't feel fully prepared, right? For, for that. Can we talk a little bit about body image? I know a lot of us talk about how we're going through an amputation, not necessarily an augmentation for our breast, right? It's not quote unquote, a free boob job. So how does body image play a role in our sexual health? I think body image is complicated, right? Because first of all, when we even say the you know, language is powerful. And when we use the term body image, it's an immediate association to something very visual and very, you know, like literally the notion of like what you look like or what you look like in someone else's eyes, what you look like in the mirror. Mm -hmm. um, what I have been struck by over the years that I've done this work is that, you know, certainly body image, you know, what we call perceived body image can be changed or disrupted. But what women often really struggle with is more of what I think of as a concept of body integrity, right? The mm -hmm. feeling of being whole, right? In one's body. Um, sometimes it, it is related to what I look like, right? But what I, um, what I really want to emphasize is that the way that people feel distressed or don't feel distressed, it isn't always directly related to something that is visual, right? Or something that um, one necessarily would see, right? So sometimes, right, there's a, there's a point of, 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 you know, how people feel about scars or how people feel about breasts that look different than they were or not real breasts at all or something in between, right? Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it's also about, for example, loss of sensation, 
right? Yes. Um, you know, we put a huge amount of emphasis on uh, reconstruction that allows women to look good. And I'm, I'm, I'm very respectful and appreciative of the incredible skill that plastics and, and, and breast surgeons can bring to that, right? I'm also very aware that none of that to date makes a difference when it comes to sensation, right? It doesn't matter how great one might look in or out of a bathing suit, but if you have no nipple sensation and nipple sensation or nipple stimulation is how you've been able to have an orgasm, you know, Mm -hmm. that's a big change and that's a big loss. Right. So I, I don't want to diminish, you know, the, the visual aspect of this notion of a body image, but I would say that the experience of, you know, do I feel like myself? Do I feel feminine? Do I feel attractive? Do I feel sexy? What does that even mean? You know, that, that is driven not only by something visual, but it's also very much driven by the experience of being in one's body, which is similar and yet very different. Right. And it is not the same. Um, And I think that that is not something we talk about nearly enough. Yeah. Very good point. We've had some conversations on the podcast with, um, you know, some friends of ours in the prosthetic space, you know, and kind of talking Mm. about different breast forms or different options that people have. We've done a couple episodes also on women who have chosen to go flat or go flat, um, you know, complications and ended up being forced to go flat. Um, you know, and, and William, my boyfriend hears that all the time when I go shopping, my entire physique has changed. And so I'll use me as an example mm. where, you know, menopause has definitely given me like the muffin top and the curvy hips and all of these great things like down below. And then my chest is so much smaller post-surgery um, mm. that, you know, I go to Macy's or, you know, a store and I'm like, I can't buy a dress, like nothing fits. Right. And then I discovered yeah. alterations. And this Uh, is a game changer. Excellent. So, you know, someone finally was like, but Laura, I know it's expensive, but you can actually get it tailored and and fit. Tailored. And I'm like, wow, mind blown. (laughs) Right. So it was just like these small little tools because I was complaining about it enough that someone was like, Okay, don't let's not get mad at society here right. because they make change you know. the dress. (laughs) Yeah. Right. But 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 I mean it's a good it's a it's a great example of how if you don't think of something because you never had to do it before, right. sometimes these accommodations are not always obvious, right? Exactly. And and I think that um, you know, it is really it, it is interesting that, you know, it's just when our bodies change, you know, mm-hmm. it's it, it it's not our bodies often are not, it takes a long time to get comfortable in our new bodies, right? Mm-hmm. And that I would say around sexuality, you know, sometimes there is a there is a, a real sense of grief and loss. And, and there's often not a lot of space to acknowledge that because one, we're just supposed to be super grateful, just period, grateful, grateful to be alive and grateful for all the good treatment we've had. And then we're supposed to be grateful that we look good because everyone says, oh my God, you look good. So more gratitude. And I'm sounding anti-gratitude, which I'm not, but, but I would say that, you know, as a psychologist, like gee whiz, we're, there's a whole lot of space here that's missing where we need to be able to allow people to also have a sense of grief and loss, especially when it comes to things like sensation, right? Whereas, especially if, if sensation used to be very pleasurable or, I mean, you know, again, there's, there's also differences, right? Some people don't, feel as attached to their breasts as others, right? So that's just, there's a range. Um, but but acknowledging that for some women, you know, it's a very big deal in terms of not just feeling sexy, but in terms of actual sexual function, actually, you know, getting aroused and having an experience of desire. And so if we don't talk about it, it, it often becomes a thing that people feel either embarrassed about or ashamed of, or they don't want to talk about and, 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 and then take that to another level, it's distracting, right? So that when you are um, trying to, for example, to have sexual activity with a partner and you're distracted in your head, because all you're thinking about is where his or her hands are or aren't, or should or shouldn't be, it's like, it takes you out of the actual experience. And now you're in your head as a spectator in this whole thing, right? Um, and, and that's also, you know, normal, but at a certain point that can become a habit and that can become a problem. Um, and people need to have, um, I would say, you know, 
there needs in the same way that you figured out how to change the dress, right? Yeah. We need to be able to like change the script or we might need exactly. to be able to sort of find a way to do it differently. So yeah, and I think what you're touching upon here too is is that survivorship piece, right? If you're going through treatment or you're in the throes of, you know, getting a PET scan and waiting results, like this might not be the time. But, you know, when when it hits you at different phases of this journey, so to speak, of breast cancer, you know, that's when we can kind of almost grieve and take that breath and just cry it out and talk to people and realize like, wow, that was really traumatic and hard and I'm still in it, right? It's not something that ever really goes away once you've been diagnosed, regardless of stage, there's always kind of hovering. And I would say there are certain things that are always reminders, right? So if you are, you know, intimate with the partner and you never have sensation, breast sensation, that's always there, right? So it's, it doesn't mean that you can't find ways to work around it and work through it and have lots of other ways to give and receive pleasure. But I would say that for most women at some point, you know, that's something that you have an awareness of and that it, that, it becomes present, but sort of all in the mix, I would say, you know. You know, when I think about people who are on ovarian suppression for extended periods of time, and I'm seeing a lot of guidelines around, you know, maybe not just five years anymore, we're thinking about ten seven, years. potentially 10 yeah. years, you know, what is the longitudinal pros and cons and things that women should be aware of when taking these life prolonging therapies? Right. So, so this is where I will defer to my oncology colleagues, because I I certainly think that, you know, I'm, I'm, I won't weigh in too much on that, but I will say this, it is really important to be able to have a conversation with your oncologist where you are really making a, an informed decision, right. About, Mm -hmm. for example, um, what the um, potential benefit is, let's say for five more years of ovarian suppression, right. That may be a conversation that you really need to have where you clearly are able to weigh the pros and cons. Mm -hmm. Um, Some women may decide one way, some women may decide another, but I would say Mm -hmm. that, you know, that's where the informed decision making is really important, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I also think that women need to be proactive about um, getting help for this collateral damage, as my colleague calls this, um, the side effects, right, of something like ovarian suppression treatment. So, you know, we all understand that it is a powerful tool in our toolkit for reducing risk of recurrence, and that's important. But we also know that, again, it there are very real side effects. And, and the fact is these side effects um, aren't just a nuisance, but a sizable number of women simply stop taking their medication because of the side effects, right? People do not stick with or adhere to the treatment. And, and you know, it's a, it's a good example of how if we did a better job of both assessing the side effects and then offering treatments for the side effects, um, then it may be easier for women to stay on these uh, tough treatment sometimes, you know? So I, I would say that, you know, I'm not saying that, that anything is perfect, but often women don't get any help at all around the sexual side effects. So, you know, I want to talk concretely for a second about what some of those things are, right? I mean, we know that we have a number of strategies to help women restore moisture to the vaginal tissue. We know that if you get good blood, blood flow to that vaginal tissue, is actually helpful and healthy for the tissue to reduce atrophy. We know that there are, um, you know, pelvic floor exercises that women can do to, re- to, to literally enhance elasticity and relax the pelvic floor muscles. You know, there are lots of, of, of pieces that we can bring um, to help women um, manage the impact of the side effects of, of ovarian um ovarian function suppression. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that, you know, it's not one-stop shopping, you know, everybody has, has different, you know, experiences and we need to sort of uh, tailor the treatments to individuals. But I would say that the, the point here is that, um, you know, it would be much easier for people to stay on these meds if we were proactive about treating the side effects. Side effects, absolutely. And, you know, I was reading a couple of your published papers that you've been working on too in partnership with some some other colleagues in this space. And I would love if you're comfortable sharing a little bit of like the findings. I don't have one particular study in mind, but you've really put your research and your time into understanding these interventions of how people, when given this information, can stay on their treatment longer and then actually have 
better outcomes as well, not just through sexual health, but through their, their regimen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, well, I guess what I would say is that, um, well, first of all, thank you for, for reading. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> you never know if anybody actually reads any of these things. So I appreciate yes. that. Um, but you know, what I would say to start with is that, um, People do not have to worry that if their doctor or nurse hasn't brought it up, that it means nothing can be done. I guess that's the first place I would start, which is just that I'm I'm recurrently struck by the fact that often um, women assume or people assume that this is something or or you know quality of life gets disrupted in some way, and it's sort of a price they have to pay because they need to save their life. And that because nobody's asked about it, there's often an assumption that there's nothing we can do about it. Right. right? Um, that is a real, uh, that's a, that's misinformation, right? I, I, I want to say that, you know, at the individual level, it may be that your oncologist or your nurse really isn't sure how to talk about this. So they don't, but the good news, and to your point, going back to the beginning, Laura, is that there are a lot of resources out there now, right? There are it's not just this podcast, right? We now have organizations that have whole websites, um, including the scientific network for female sexual health and cancer, which is a long phrase, but uh, you know, scientific network. And if you Google scientific network and cancer, you'll come, it'll come up Perfect. full disclosure. I am the chair, but anyway, oh, um, but yeah, we we'll definitely link to that too. So people can get access yeah, yeah. to it. But like, but we have a whole resource page with tons of resources. And the reason I say this is because, you know, it used to be again in the old days, if you're, team wasn't sure what to do. And before we had lots of information and resources online, people really were kind of like, you know, where do I even go or what do I do? But what I am delighted about now is that, you know, we can access care, right? We can, you know, find out what is a moisturizer. Oh, that's actually different than a lubricant. That's super important when it comes to vaginal health, right? That knowing that a lubricant just keeps the surface of the skin slick during sexual activity, but it doesn't hold water in the tissue. And that any woman who's dealing with any kind of menopausal symptoms needs to be moisturizing that tissue on a regular basis forever, not for a week, not for a year. It's like from now until the end of time, it's kind of like brushing your teeth or washing your hair. It's like part of self-care, you know? And I would just say that, you know, learning some of the basics around vaginal health is you know, good information out there and widely available. Um, but similarly, also, you know, just being able to get some tips or tricks about how do you talk to your partner? How do you start a conversation? How do you date? When do you tell somebody if you're if you're dating? And I, you know, I just sat with a bunch of women, um, you know, ovarian cancer uh, folks in in a retreat in the woods a few uh, days ago, and we were talking about you know dating, right? And and the, there's always that question like. Do you, do you disclose on the first date? When do you say? What do you say? How much do you say? But like, if you don't know, it's helpful to get some some ideas about that, you know? Um, so I think that, you know, being able to access resources, even if it is not with your team, you know, or even if it's being able to say to your doctor, I know this might, might not be your area of expertise, but I'm having a really tough time with menopausal changes, is there a menopause expert that you can refer me to? If you can't get one that way, you can get on the, you know, the NAMS, the North American Menopause Society website and look up who a certified menopause specialist is in your area. You know, so I think that this is, again, one of the ways that I think the world is better now, you know, that people are able to sort of access resources in a, in a broader way, even if it isn't um, obvious or local, you know, or something that your nurse or your doctor may be particularly informed about. So what I'm hearing is it's never too late, right? So even if you're suffering in silence, it's never too late. Never, and you're actually giving us like the script of how to ask the question and, you know, not kind of have that awkward feeling of like, oh, what if my doctor doesn't know? Or how do I, how do I approach this? Right. It's just like, can you point me in the right direction? What resources are you- out there? Right. And, and, and don't start that conversation at the end of your visit, you know, make a point at some point when you start a visit and it doesn't need to be any specific visit, but to say, um, I've had a lot of changes in sexual function. I want to take a minute to talk about that. Let me know when I can ask you some questions, right. Or let me know, um, if this is a good time to ask, um, who might be an expert that I can't talk to, um, because it's really, you know, I, 
I, I actually feel I have a lot more sympathy uh, than I used to uh, because, you know, I think what we know is that even starting in um, medical school, and we've actually done lots of surveys about this, nobody gets any training in sexual health. It's really interesting, right? Mm-hmm. When you go to medical school, at some point you learn a little bit about sexually transmitted infection. You learn about, you know, sexually transmitted diseases and what you have to do about that. But there is like no training mm. at any point about how to talk to people about sexual health and sexuality. And it's interesting if anybody does that, it's actually pediatricians and like young adult medical folks, but people who don't go that route, right. Who just do kind of like adult medicine. It's amazing how um, they don't ever get any training. So when we do surveys and we say like, what, what are the barriers? The first thing that they, what physicians tell us and oncologists tell us is that they don't feel comfortable. Right. Mm, they, right. they, they're not sure what to say. They don't want to embarrass anyone. They don't want to feel embarrassed, but right. primarily they don't feel competent. Right. Because mm. of all the things that they do, this is not really their area. Well, they're like experts so, in their, in their thing that yeah, they have, which is why exactly. we go to them. And so exactly. you know, when we start exactly. deviating out of that into some of these survivorship topics, like we don't right. know who to turn to. And so, right. yeah, I totally right. appreciate that. Are there recommendations or guidelines for sexual health? So it's fun. It's actually great. It's a, it's a funny question. I mean, it's a great question, but it, 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 I say it's funny because I, I start many of my lectures with this. There actually are many guidelines out there. Okay. ASCO has guidelines. NCCN has guidelines. There are actually lots of guidelines that say in the context of survivorship care, you should ask about sexual health. What's interesting is that that does not translate to what actually happens in clinical care most of the time. Yes. And and I do, and I do um, I think I mentioned earlier about the social cultural stuff, because that's something that I'm very interested in. I do find that kind of interesting, right? That of all the things that we do and don't talk about, um, especially given that we live in a culture suffused with sex everywhere you look, right? You can't see a TV commercial or movie without a sex scene, but that is very different than real conversation about real sexuality with real people. There's, it's a very big difference, right? Mm -hmm. And for all the porn that's out there, there's a lot of porn out there. Again, that's the sort of um, projected visualization and fantasy of an 18 year old male mind, right? It's mm-hmm. usually not anything about women or about sex positive experiences for real people in midlife, right? It's right, like exactly. it's very limited, very <laughs> limited, you know? Um, and I think that um, it does, it's important for all of us to recognize that it's still pretty taboo, right? Yeah, it's still it something is. that is not people are not, I mean, we're talking now about financial toxicity. There are all kinds of things that we talk about, but it's amazing how, um, despite the guidelines, right. And despite clearly, um, patient voices, right. We have study after study, after study saying people don't feel prepared. People want more information. I don't, you know, we don't need a new study to show that this is important to people. It's kind of interesting that there's still this big disconnect, right. That it's not, you know, it's not part of um, a review of systems the way we ask about pain and nausea and fatigue. Sexual function should just be on the list. Exactly. You know, it should just be part of the part of the review of everything else that we do. So yeah. I, I would say that, you know, this is where as survivors and advocates and patients, um, it's it's a powerful community. And, and that, you know, you know this as well as I do. Um, it's also a business. It's a big business. And we're the consumers mm-hmm. in some ways, right? Yeah. Patients are the consumers. And so being able to continue to elevate those patient voices and survivorship voices around needing to have this be a part of care, to me, is probably the strongest way that we can move that needle, you know, in terms of having this be part of uh, just regular conversation. I love that. I love that. I think that's the perfect way to just like have this message out there and resonate with our listeners and people on our mailing list and share this audio with people to let them know that there's tools, there's amazing opportunities that are happening in cancer centers, developing these programs, and that hopefully we can replicate and take, you know, this prototype that you've developed over the last two decades and have this be accessible in various modalities in person and virtual and giving people really the the access to to that information. So this has been a phenomenal conversation. I feel like we just scratched the surface. I can already see my inbox exploding with like follow-up questions. So I'm sure that we'll continue the conversation. Is there anything that we haven't discussed that you would like to share that um, you want to leave our listeners with? 
Um, you know, I guess I would just say, and very specifically around resources, I, 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 I'm going to put a plug in for the scientific network on female sexual health and cancer, um, largely because, you know, one is an organization near and dear to me. This is basically a, was started out as we call, as we all, we often say, we started as a hippie co-op um, of, <laughs> of, of researchers and clinicians around the country and the world that were doing some of this and needing to network together. Um, but we really also are, are very keen and interested in inviting um, patient advocates and, and, and people across the spectrum yeah. to uh, get involved. Um, and more importantly, we have a, a really nice website that has lots of resources. So, you know, sure. people should feel free to, uh, to get on the website and, and there are links to, you know, programs, across the country to books, to articles, to, uh, you know, just handouts that really is sort of are very concrete uh, yeah. about things that people can do and skills to be able to make things better. So um, I really want people to, to, to not feel alone um, in this and to know that there is help available. That's wonderful. We'll definitely link to all of that. I'm a big fan of not reinventing the wheel. You know, our time here at Surviving Breast Cancer is precious to say the least. And so, you know, the more that we can partner with other organizations and networks and experts and advocacy groups to bring together the information in a digestible way that people can access easily, why not? So yeah. thank you. I I really appreciate Thank that. you. Thanks for having me. And I would say, you know, I know you you have just to say I'm a big fan of yours and what oh, you've been able you. to do in terms of reaching so many people. Um mm -hmm. it, because the 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 fact is um that that is power, right? Knowledge mm -hmm. is power and the capacity to be able to touch so many people is exciting. So it's been a pleasure to to be here with you. And thank you all for listening and tuning in week after week here on Breast Cancer Conversations. Please be mindful that all of our content and information is for educational purposes only and is never a substitute for medical advice. If you want to hang out, again, please check out survivingbreastcancer.org forward slash events where you can RSVP to our Thursday Night Thrivers weekly meetup, our Movement Monday classes, workshops, seminars, and so much more. We can also continue the dialogue online via social media. Our Instagram handle is survivingbreastcancer.org, all one word, and you can follow us on Twitter at SBC underscore ORG. Until next time, keep on thriving. <laughs>